Hello everyone, my name is Michelle, I hope you're doing well and welcome to episode 14 of Crime Stories Sunday. This one is a chilling case. I remember this case being all up in the news when I was a kid. I actually lived in the county of Yorkshire where this horrible story is set during the 1970s so I remember it being all over the news. It was scary. This story is set in the county of Yorkshire in England. And uh, Peter Sutcliffe was dubbed the Yorkshire Ripper by the media due to the brutality of his crimes. Absolutely horrendous, the things he did. Some of the women that he murdered were prostitutes, just like the 19th century London killer, Jack the Ripper. When he was finally caught though, he claimed that the voice of God had sent him on a mission to kill prostitutes. Well, as we'll see, not all of the women he murdered were prostitutes. The search for Sutcliffe was one of the largest and most expensive manhunts in British history. And West Yorkshire police who led up the investigation were largely criticised for the failure to catch him sooner. They'd actually interviewed him nine times in the course of this five-year investigation. So this is a frightening, shocking case. Buckle up, because this is a wild one. Peter William Sutcliffe was born on the 2nd of June, 1946, to a working-class family in Bingley, West Yorkshire. His parents were John William Sutcliffe, and his mother was called Kathleen. Peter was the eldest of six children. He had three sisters, Anne, Jean and Maureen, and two brothers, Mick and Carl. He was born prematurely and his doctors told his parents he would likely not survive. Unfortunately, he did. The children were raised as strict Catholics, but despite all this, Father John was a violent alcoholic. Peter gravitated towards his mother he loved her. He wanted to protect her, but he couldn't because he was a kid and his father was so very violent. One of uh, Peter's brothers admitted that their father was so abusive, stating that once he smashed a beer glass over Peter's head just because Peter sat in the wrong chair. We see this story so often, don't we, where, you know, serial murderers tend to grow up in just a horrible environment. Do they learn their trade from there? Is there a genetic component? I don't know, I can't answer that because not all serial murderers come from horrible homes. It's just an important correlation maybe to think about. In his adolescence though, Sutcliffe developed a growing obsession with voyeurism. He spent much of his time spying on prostitutes in red light districts. This was a chilling foreboding for what was to become later. Reportedly, through his childhood and his adolescence, Peter Sutcliffe was a loner. He didn't have many friends. He left school at the age of 15 and had a series of jobs, including two stints as a grave digger in the 1960s. But then he started to get his life together, at least in terms of his employment status. And between November 1971 and April 1973, he worked in a television factory on a packaging line. But then he got a promotion and he became a traveling salesman for this television company. In February 1975, he took a redundancy package. This was the 1970s, you know, it was, it was hard times here in, uh, the UK, as I guess it was uh, all over the world. He used half of the £400 payoff to train as a heavy goods vehicle driver. He got a job as a truck driver, but in March 1976, he was dismissed for the theft of, uh, he was stealing used tyres, and I, I guess selling them on, I don't know. So he was unemployed for a few months, but then in October 1976, he found another job as a truck driver. And he stuck to this job. Like I said, he had started to get his uh, employment status kind of together. The travelling allowed him the freedom to commit the crimes 
and just go on detective for so long that would eventually make him infamous as the Yorkshire Ripper. Peter, by some reports, hired prostitutes as a young man. It's not surprising if he was spying on them and spying on their activities. Now, uh, this is a speculation, but this is reported in a number of sources that he had a bad experience during uh, a time with uh, a prostitute in which he was conned out of money by a pimp. And some people say that that was what inspired him to go on to take revenge. I'm not sure about that. I think when someone commits murders that are so horrific, something very simple like being conned out of money, you know, it doesn't compare in comparison. It, it doesn't compute to me. I mean, yeah, he might remember that occasion. He might talk about that occasion, but did it really make him a serial killer? I suspect not. I think in his mind, it was much more complicated than that. Anyway, Sutcliffe met Sonia Zuma on the 14th of February, 1967. It was Valentine's Day. It, it took them a few years to tie the knot though, and they married on the 10th of August, 1974. They wanted to have children. I guess uh, it's quite lucky that they didn't, but Sonia suffered several miscarriages and they were informed that she would never be able to carry a child. So she concentrated on her career and uh, she took a teacher training course. During this course, she had an affair with an ice cream van driver, <sighs> Mr. Whippy. Who remembers Mr. Whippy if you live in the UK? <laughs> when Sonia had completed the training course and she began teaching, she and Sutcliffe used her salary to buy a house at Seven Garden Lane in Heaton, a suburb of Bradford. And they moved there in 1977. They were still living in that home when Peter was finally arrested years later. Now let's get into the gruesome part. There is some gruesome descriptions here, so count this as a trigger warning. Let's turn to his extensive and increasingly violent criminal career. Sutcliffe's first documented assault was on a prostitute in Bradford way back in 1969. Allegedly, who he met while out searching for this woman who'd conned him. So maybe this con did uh, run quite deep in his mind. He was with his friend, Trevor Birdsall, and uh, he left Trevor in, uh, in their van, walked up St Paul's Road in Bradford, until he was out of sight of Trevor. Some time later, Peter returned. He was out of breath like he'd been running. He said he'd followed a prostitute into a garage and hit her over the head with a stone in a sack. So Trevor was understandably shocked by this, but uh, he didn't say anything. But police visited Peter's home the next day as the woman herself reported the attack. She was clever, she was clued in, she was streetwise. She'd remembered Trevor Birdsall's vehicle registration number. Peter admitted that he'd hit her, but claimed it was with his hand and it wasn't very hard. The police told him he was very lucky that they weren't gonna take this any further. But in the general scheme of things, this was very minor in relation to what Peter did next. So we're gonna fast forward six years to the night of the 5th of July, 1975, when Peter Sutcliffe committed his second, much more serious assault in Keithley in West Yorkshire. So this is where he attacked Anna Rogluski, striking her unconscious with a hammer. Hammers feature a lot in his killings. He also slashed her stomach with a knife. He seemed to attack women in the abdomen. I'm wondering whether that's, I don't know, some playback to his wife Sonia not being able to have children. I don't know. His, his crimes created a pattern though, which I find interesting. She was terribly badly injured, but he was disturbed by a neighbor and he left before actually finishing the job. Anna survived and uh, after neurological surgery, 
she was physically okay, but she was psychologically traumatized by the attack. And I've got a quote here from Anna. She said, I've been afraid to go out much because I feel people are staring at me and pointing at me. The whole thing is making my life a misery. I sometimes wish I had died in that attack. That really whetted Sutcliffe's appetite and the attacks then became thick and fast. So on the night of 15th of August, Sutcliffe attacked Olive Smelt in Halifax, West Yorkshire. One of my second time's great grandfathers was from Halifax. He briefly engaged Smelt in a commonplace pleasantry about the weather, because you know, British people talk about the weather, before striking hammer blows to her skull from behind. He disarranged her clothing, slashed her lower back with a knife. Again though, he was interrupted and he left his victim badly injured, but alive, barely alive. Like Anna before her, she suffered severe and emotional mental trauma. She told interviewing officer, Superintendent Dick Holland, who when the investigation started, he ended up second in command in the Ripper squad. She told him that her attacker had a Yorkshire accent. Similar to my accent, but not quite. A lot of people think that I'm from Yorkshire. I'm not actually, but it's a similar accent, right? So imagine the type of accent that I have. Quite distinctive. We've got a lot of different regional accents in the, in the UK. But this information was ignored. It actually proved crucial to the investigation, but it was ignored, completely ignored. But neither of these attacks were in red light districts. He just seemed to have chosen these women at random. So what he said about God speaking to him to rid the world of prostitutes, maybe that came later, I don't know. But just a few days later, on the 27th of August, Peter attacked 14-year-old Tracy Brown. Again, he struck her behind the head with a hammer while she was just quietly walking along a country lane, just at random. He ran off when he saw the lights of a passing car, again, leaving his victim alive, but severely traumatized and requiring brain surgery. Peter was never connected to this attack because it seemed when the Ripper squad formed and started investigating, it seemed very different than his other attacks in that the victim was only 14. The police became obsessed with the prostitute connection and the fact that he'd attacked women or girls who weren't prostitutes, again, seemed to go somewhat unnoticed which again was one of the, the police failings of this investigation. But uh, yeah, this one wasn't included in Peter's crimes, but he admitted to it, actually, years later in 1992. And he said, allegedly, that this was one of the crimes that he regrets, because she was such a little girl. The first victim to be killed by Peter Sutcliffe was Wilma McCann on the 30th of October. She was from Scott Hall, a suburb of Leeds. She was the mother of four children between the ages of two and seven. He, again, shook her on the back of her skull twice with a hammer, inflicted a stab wound to the throat, slashing, stabbing, and there was a series of nine stab wounds around her belly button. It's uncanny, it's like he's attacking the abdomen. I find that really interesting. An extensive inquiry ensued. They collected information from 11,000 people, like in witnesses, potential suspects. They went to town on it, but they failed to find the culprit. This murder has took a dramatic toll on the McCann family. In December 2007, Wilma McCann's eldest daughter, Sonia, took her own life, reportedly after suffering years of anguish and depression over the circumstances of her mother's murder. Richard McCann, Wilma McCann's son, 
is interesting. I just want to spend a moment talking about Richard. One week before his sixth birthday, Richard lost his mother. And as a result, his life went into a downward spiral. He really suffered, like his sister, like all of his siblings, he really suffered because of what Peter Sutcliffe did. There were so many secondary victims to Peter Sutcliffe's crimes. It's just horrible. But it wasn't until many years later he was able to use his experience to create a lasting and a positive change in the world. And this is a quote from Richard. Three years after my mum's death, I began to believe that it was my responsibility to carry out some kind of revenge on behalf of my family. This was a little boy. I wanted to kill random males and fantasised about attacking them from behind with a hammer. You know, like Peter had done to his mother and many others. In my mind, they represented society as a whole and ultimately everything around me that caused my mother's untimely and violent departure. Also, when I was older, I found myself occasionally acting aggressively towards girlfriends, which scared me because I didn't want to become like my dad. Wilma had had a violent partner. She didn't have a very good life. But Sutcliffe just took so much away from the McCann family. But he didn't go down that dark path. Emotionally, psychologically, Richard fought back against these emotions and he really did make a positive change. He's now an advocate for the Forgiveness Project, which collects and shares stories from both victims and perpetrators of crime. Those people who've rebuilt their lives following hurt, trauma and death. So I think that's really positive. And he, he does a lot of lectures, guest appearances, interviews, that kind of thing. But anyway, back to Peter Sutcliffe. He committed his next murder in Leeds on the 20th of January 1976, where he stabbed 42-year-old Emily Jackson 52 times. She didn't want to be a prostitute, but it was the 1970s, there was dire financial situations for so many people. And she had been persuaded by her husband that she could make easy money as a prostitute, using the van of the family roofing business. So clearly the roofing business wasn't doing very well. <sighs> anyway, Sutcliffe picked up Jackson and drove about half a mile to some derelict buildings. Again, Sutcliffe hit her over the head with her hammer, knocked her out completely, dragged her body into a, a rubbish strewn yard and then used a screwdriver, a sharpened screwdriver, to stab her in the neck, chest and abdomen repeatedly, such a frenzied attack. He stamped on her thigh, leaving behind an impression of his boot. Next, he attacked a 20-year-old Marcella Claxon in Roundhay Park in Leeds, and this was on the 9th of May. She was walking home from a party and maybe she was a bit tipsy, maybe she just wanted to get home. But unfortunately, she accepted a lift from Peter Sutcliffe. She needed to use the toilet and there was none around, so she got out of the car and, and urinated, like in the bushes. He snuck up on her and hit her behind the head with a hammer. She survived and she testified against Peter at his trial. At the time of this attack, Claxon had been four months pregnant and subsequently miscarried her baby. So another little life lost to Peter Sutcliffe, who himself couldn't have children. It's interesting. She required multiple extensive brain surgeries and suffered from blackouts and chronic depression. Then, on the 5th of February, 1977, Sutcliffe attacked Irene Richardson 
a prostitute again in Roundhay Park in Leeds. Richardson was bludgeoned to death, frenzied attack with a hammer. After death, Sutcliffe mutilated her corpse with a knife. Tire tracks left near the murder scene resulted in a long list of possible suspect vehicles. So keep all of these little facts in mind because uh, we're going to get on to the investigation. Two months later, on the 23rd of April, he attacked Patricia Atkinson, a prostitute from Bradford, and this was in her home, where police found a boot print on her bedclothes. Just two months after that, on the 26th of June, he murdered 16-year-old Jane MacDonald in Chapel Town. She wasn't a prostitute, like some of his other victims weren't. But in the public perception, because this was, as I said, all up in the news, all over the news, this was, this was a national tragedy. But in Yorkshire particularly, you know, this was, this was horrific. Like, people didn't know who was going to be next, like, literally. But in the public perception, her murder showed that all women were potential victims. And she was kind of posted in the news as the first innocent victim because she wasn't a prostitute. The attitude in the West Yorkshire Police Force at the time reflected Peter's own misogyny. And this is according to multiple sources and an investigation of the investigation later, years later. Jim Hobson, a senior West Yorkshire detective, told a press conference, the perpetrator, and I quote, has made it clear that he hates prostitutes. Many people do. We as a police force will continue to arrest prostitutes, but the Ripper is now killing innocent girls. The Attorney General, Sir Michael Havers, at Peter's trial in 1981, said of Sutcliffe's victims in his opening statement, some were prostitutes, but perhaps the saddest part of the case was that some were not. The last six attacks were on totally respectable women. As if, like, murdering a prostitute was... Well, that was less, less important in some way. And years later, you know, this was still talked about as the police being sexist, misogynistic and just completely thoughtless in the way that they approached some of Sutcliffe's crimes. Ugh, I don't know, it's horrible. Anyway, back to Sutcliffe. He seriously assaulted Maureen Long in Bradford in July 1977. As with some of his other victims, he was interrupted and he fled. He thought he'd killed her though, he left her for dead. When she was found, she was suffering from hypothermia and she was in hospital recovering for nine weeks. A witness saw his car, but had misidentified the make of it, resulting in more than 400 police officers checking thousands of cars of the make that this witness thought, without success because they weren't looking for the right type of vehicle. Then, on October 1977, Sutcliffe murdered Jean Jordan, a prostitute from Manchester. So this was outside of Yorkshire. Manchester is more kind of over my neck of the woods. He had realised the new five pound note he had given her was traceable. He knew he'd made a mistake. He later returned to the wasteland where he'd left his victim in an attempt to try to recover the five pound note, but he was unable to find it. It was not until nine days later, on the 9th of October, that Jordan's body was discovered by a local worker. The five pound note was hidden in a secret compartment in Jordan's handbag. Now it was traced, it was traced to branches of the Midland Bank in Shipley and Bingley. Police analysis of bank operations allowed them to narrow their field of inquiry to 8,000 employees who could potentially have been given that £5 note in their pay. 
Over three months, the police interviewed 5,000 men, including Peter Sutcliffe. The police found that an alibi given for Peter Sutcliffe's whereabouts was credible. And uh, he had indeed spent much of the evening at a family party. And he just kind of slipped out of the party to commit an assault. Went back to the party like nothing had happened. So there's lots of witnesses that Peter was there at the party. No one noticed him slip away. And then he went back to try to find the five pound note. But again, no one noticed. But he had an alibi, right? He had lots of alibis. Probably more than seven alibis. <laughs> then on the 14th of December, Sutcliffe attacked Marilyn Moore, another prostitute from Leeds. She survived and provided police with a description of her attacker. Tire tracks found at the scene matched those from an earlier attack. So they knew they were searching for a particular vehicle. Just what vehicle, they didn't know. She survived and her photo fit bore a strong resemblance to Peter Sutcliffe. She'd remembered his face. But like many other survivors, she provided a good description of him and his car which have been seen all about red light districts and just around and about. They weren't listening to the victims. They'd been interviewed on this issue, but they took no further action. Fast forward to January 1978 and Sutcliffe killed again. This was 21 year old Yvonne Pearson, a prostitute from Bradford. He repeatedly bludgeoned her about the head with a hammer and, and jumped up and down on her chest. He stuffed horse hair into her mouth from a discarded sofa. He like pulled out the, the, the stuffing from a discarded sofa on this wasteland. And then he hid her body under this sofa. And then 10 days later, he killed Helen Reitke, an 18 year old prostitute from Huddersfield. He struck her on the head five times as she exited his vehicle before stripping most of her clothes away and repeatedly stabbing her in the chest and abdomen. Her body was found three days later underneath railway arches. He said while in police custody in 1981, I had the urge to kill any woman. The urge inside me to kill girls was now practically uncontrollable. He was. He was just out of control. But yet he was able to just go home and be perfectly normal. No one suspected him. Go about his life, go about his job. Ugh. Then for some strange reason, he took a hiatus of about a year, or over a year. And it wasn't until the 4th of April, 1979, that Peter killed Josephine Whittaker, a 19-year-old building society clerk, so not a prostitute, who was attacked in Savile Park Moor in Halifax. She was just walking home, minding her own business. Despite forensic evidence at the scene, police efforts were diverted for several months following the receipt of the taped message, a hoax purporting to be from the murderer, taunting Assistant Chief George Oldfield. George Oldfield was the guy who did a lot of the press conferences. So his name and his face, his, his job, they were all well known. So this hoaxer concentrated this, this hoax on George Oldfield and it became personal for George. And this hoaxer was taken very, very seriously. So unlike the details that they got from the victims, when it became personal to George Oldfield, that's what they focused on, unfortunately. The tape contained a man's voice saying, I'm Jack. And I'll let you listen to the message. I'm Jack. I say you are still having no luck catching me. 
I have a great respect for you, George. But Lord, you are no near catching me now than four years ago when I started. I have the greatest respect for you, George. But Lord, you are no near catching me now than four years ago when I started. Based on the recorded message, police began searching for a man with a Wearside accent. So, very different accent to a Yorkshire accent. This was a Geordie accent, for anybody who knows what a Geordie accent sounds like. They brought linguists in, and they, uh, they narrowed down the specifics of the accent to Castletown, an area of Sunderland in Tyne and Weir. And the hoaxer was dubbed Wearside Jack by the press. He sent two letters in addition to this tape recording. The letters signed Jack the Ripper claim responsibility for 26-year-old Joan Harrison in Preston in Lancashire in November 1975. She actually wasn't one of Suckler's victims. Well, the hoaxer was just uh, making shit up, basically. Years later, though, when DNA technology became more reliable, they opened the case and, and tried to find out who this hoaxer was. So this was long after Peter Sutcliffe was in prison. In 2005, they took DNA from the envelopes that had been kept in evidence lockers, and it was entered into the National DNA Database, and it matched to that of John Samuel Humble, an unemployed alcoholic and a long-time resident of the Ford Estate in Sunderland, a few miles from Castletown. So the, the linguists have been right in, uh, you know, honing down this accent to a very specific area. But uh, anyway, his DNA was on the database following a drunken disorderly offence four years before this. So, on the 20th of October 2005, Humble was charged with attempting to pervert the course of justice for sending hoax letters and tape, tape recordings which completely, you know, disrupted the, the Yorkshire Ripper investigation. He was remanded in custody and on the 21st of March 2006 he was convicted and sentenced to eight years in prison. He died in July 2019, age 63. Anyway, back to Sutcliffe. On the 1st of September 1979, Sutcliffe murdered 20-year-old Barbara Leach, a Bradford University student, not a prostitute. Her body was dumped under a pile of bricks close to the university. This was his 16th attack, if you've been counting. This was a murder of a woman, again, who wasn't a prostitute, and again, alarmed the public much more than the prostitute murders. It prompted an expensive, extensive publicity campaign emphasising the Wearside connections based on this hoax from Wearside Jack. Despite the false lead, Sutcliffe was interviewed yet again <laughs> and on another two occasions. They kept going back to him, but they were disregarding him for, for various reasons and despite matching several forensic clues and being on the list of the 300 names in connection with the £5 note, like quietly behind the scenes, they'd been working down this list of who might have owned this five pound note. And they got it down to 300 people, Sutcliffe being one. But no, no, he was let go. In April, 1980, he was arrested for drunk driving. He was out on bail, awaiting trial. He killed two more women while he was on bail, awaiting trial. He murdered 47 year old Marguerite Walls on the 20th of August 1980 and 20-year-old Jacqueline Hill, uh, a student from Leeds University, on the night of the 17th of November 1980. And uh, he attacked three other women who survived, Opaidia Bandara in Leeds on the 24th of September 1980, 
Maureen Lear, an art student, attacked him the grounds of Leeds University. So he was getting bolder and bolder and bolder. And then 16-year-old Teresa Sykes, who was attacked in Huddersfield in November 1980. Now, how did he get caught? You know, he'd been on the rampage for years by this point. So on the 25th of November 1980, Trevor Birdsall, do you remember the guy with the van from the assault, the very first recorded assault of Peter Sutcliffe in 1969? He came forward. It was Birdsall who finally put two and two together and reported him to the police. But still, the police disregarded him. He'd been interviewed so many times. He was on their suspect list that had been narrowed down to 300 people. But there was 299 other people on this list. And Sutcliffe did not have a Geordie accent. He had a Yorkshire accent. So they'd taken this hoax, literally. They'd fallen down this narrow path. And it... It was a really bad investigation. I mean, look, it was a bad investigation, but they worked really hard, right? These were, these were really challenging crimes. There was thousands of people working on this investigation who tried their very, very best, but the mishandling really came from the top. It wasn't the workers, it was the management. It was the handling of it that I think was the problem. Anyway, on the 2nd of January 1981, Peter Sutcliffe was stopped by the police with 24-year-old prostitute Olivia Reavers in Broomhill, Sheffield, uh, further south in South Yorkshire. A police check by a constable, Robert Hines, revealed Sutcliffe's car had false number plates and he was arrested and he was transferred to the Dewsbury Police Station in West Yorkshire, close to where he lived. At Dewsbury, he was questioned in relation to the Yorkshire Ripper case yet again, because he matched many of the known characteristics and he was on this list. The next day, police returned to the scene of the arrest, discovered a knife, a hammer, and a rope. And he was able to slip away because he said he was bursting for a pee. So they let him wander off into the bushes to have a pee, in which time he was able to discard these weapons. Sutcliffe hid a second knife in the toilet cistern of the police station when he was permitted to use the toilet whilst under interview. So they hadn't even searched him when when they took him in for questioning. He had this knife on him. The police obtained a search warrant for his home in Heaton and, uh, and brought his wife in for questioning because they'd started to really suspect this guy now. They'd started to put the clues together. And this was a lot of attacks over a number of years. So they wanted to see what the wife had to say, what evidence she could provide. And also, I guess she could have been an accomplice. Now, get this, right, get this. I, I, I don't know how you can even, like, imagine this in your mind, but try. When Sutcliffe was stripped at the police station, he was wearing an inverted V-necked jumper sweater under his trousers. The sleeves had been, like, pulled over his legs, and the V-neck exposed his genital area, so it was... It was difficult not to see that there was a, some kind of sexual motive here. Although, actually, it was probably that the elbows were padded and he kind of pulled the sleeves down and this, this padding was protecting his knees. So, presumably, when he knelt over his victims, like, brutalising them, he didn't get sore knees. Ah. Oh. Oh, right. After two days of extensive questioning, on the afternoon of the 4th of January 1981, Sutcliffe confessed. He declared that he was the Ripper. 
he'd had enough. So over the next day, he calmly described his many attacks in as much detail as he can remember. He claimed God had told him to murder the women. The women I killed were filth, he told police. Bastard prostitutes who were littering the streets. I was just cleaning up the place a bit. Yeah, right. Sutcliffe displayed regret only when talking about his youngest murder victim, Jane MacDonald. And years later, he expressed regret for attacking that 14-year-old girl as well. So Sutcliffe was charged with murder. And although he'd made this full confession, he took this to trial. He pled not guilty to 13 charges of murder, but guilty to manslaughter on the grounds of diminished responsibility. So his defence used insanity, claimed to be a tool of God's will and therefore declared insane. Sutcliffe said he had heard voices that ordered him to kill prostitutes while working as a gravedigger back in the 1960s. Interestingly, his brother Carl never believed his story of being mentally ill. The prosecution intended to accept Sutcliffe's plea after four psychiatrists diagnosed him with paranoid schizophrenia. But the trial judge, Justice Sir Leslie Boreham, demanded an unusually detailed explanation of the prosecution's reasoning. And the judge rejected the diminished responsibility plea, despite him being diagnosed with paranoid schizophrenia. He said, no, the case should be dealt with by a jury. So the trial proper commenced on the 5th of May, 1981. It lasted only two weeks, despite the efforts of his counsel, James Chadwick QC. Sutcliffe was found guilty of murder on all counts and he was sentenced to 20 concurrent life sentences. The jury rejected the evidence of the psychiatrists that Sutcliffe had paranoid schizophrenia. Possibly influenced by the evidence of a prison officer who heard him say to his wife, who was complicit in all of this, like she wasn't an accomplice, but she stuck by him. She stuck by him, she visited him, she continued to stick by him. But a prison officer during a visiting hour heard him say to his wife that it was, if he was convicted, because he was declared insane, he might only get 10 years. So, like his brother said, perhaps he was just clever. Perhaps he wasn't insane at all. The trial judge said Sutcliffe was beyond redemption and hoped he would never leave prison. His recommendation was a minimum term of 30 years to be served before parole could be considered, meaning Sutcliffe would have been unlikely to be freed until 2011. Fortunately, he wasn't, because in July 2010, the High Court issued Sutcliffe with a whole life tariff. And we don't have a lot of whole life tariffs in the UK. You know, in the US, you get done for murder, it's usually either death penalty in certain states or life without the possibility of parole. But it's not like that in the UK. But anyway, Sutcliffe was never going to be released. So there's that at least. West Yorkshire Police was criticised, as I've kind of been intimating throughout this. They were inadequately prepared for an investigation on this scale. And it predated the use of computers. So they were using like record cards and all these workers were just overwhelmed, tried their very best, but were overwhelmed. And it was so difficult to work through all of this to find the facts. The floor of the incident room had to be reinforced to cope with the weight of the paper. So thank God for computers, hey, <laughs> gee. It was difficult for officers to overcome this information overload. And yeah, that was, that was a major failing. But as I said, the, the main failings really came from the top and the attitudes of the management and the ignoring of important evidence from the victims and then running along this incorrect track when we are side Jack sent in that hoax that George Oldfield took personally. 
The results of the 1982 Byford report, which was the investigation is the investigation, concluded the ineffectiveness of the major incident room was a serious handicap to the Ripper investigation. While it should have been the effective nerve centre of the whole police operation, the backlog of unprocessed information resulted in the failure to connect vital pieces of related information. This serious fault in the central index system allowed Peter Sutcliffe to continually slip through the net. The choice of George Oldfield to lead the Ripper investigation was questioned. Um, they said he was too old. He was too stuck in his ways. He was an old school detective, but not equipped to deal with the vast amount of evidence. And, uh, and what it needed, said the Byford report, it needed an officer of sound professional competence, that's damning, who will inspire confidence and loyalty. You know, the, the way he took personally, we aside Jack's tape, was was very much called into question and his ignoring of advice from survivors who given details they just not put all of the pieces together anyway what happened to peter sutcliffe following his conviction and incarceration he began his sentence at hm prison pankhurst in may 1981 he carried on claiming that he had paranoid schizophrenia and eventually in March 1984, so three years later, he was actually sent to a psychiatric hospital instead of a prison. And there he lived in Broadmoor Hospital under Section 47 of the Mental Health Act. When he was there in Broadmoor, he became friends with one of the visitors of Broadmoor, a child predator, the celebrity Jimmy Savile. In December 2015, Sutcliffe was assessed as being no longer mentally ill. <laughs> like his schizophrenia had gone away. Schizophrenia doesn't go away, guys. Come on. He was faking the whole time. He was sent back to prison. He was sent to HM Prison Franklin in uh, County Durham. He died in the University Hospital of North Durham, aged 74, on the 13th of November 2020. Have he been sent there with COVID-19? He'd had a number of underlying health problems. You know, he was, he'd become very obese. He had diabetes as a result of his obesity. And he refused all treatment. So there's that. The pandemic took the life of the horrific serial killer, Peter Sutcliffe. So good on COVID-19. I remember living through this media onslaught and it went on for years. Finally, he was taken off the streets, but he could have been taken off the streets far, far sooner. But anyway, let me know what you think in the comments below. I've been Michelle. I hope you're well. It's goodbye from Miss Tillington, Miss Cassie Springer, and I'll be back next week with episode 15 of Crime Stories Sunday. I don't know what case I'm gonna do. I haven't decided yet. I've got a few possibles, but I haven't decided yet. So it'll be a surprise for all of us. Okay, bye guys.